So I'm going to set the scene here. The disciples, remember, they, they're out feeding the 5,000. They're out in the middle of a desert. They're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's no restaurants. There's no city life at all. Um, they couldn't get to a place to dine. And here he has multitudes upon multitudes following him, thronging him. At every turn, he has a crowd. He's at the peak of his earthly ministry right now. All the miracles, all the things that he's done have attracted these crowds, and they're going to great lengths to see him at all costs. Well, in fact, the religious crowd, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, they traveled all the way from Jerusalem out in the middle of nowhere just to get a gotcha question out to Jesus. You see, he was cutting into their, their flocks. He was cutting into their finances. He was cutting into their popularity. And people were starting to follow the truth or at least inquire about God's word and that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, their king, to bring the kingdom of God. He was claiming to be the prophet that Moses, who they highly revered from the Old Testament, Moses said that the prophet would one day come from the Father to set up the kingdom. And he's proclaiming to be that very prophet, as he is. And so he's got the crowds, but the religious crowd, they're out to get him. They want this gotcha question to come before him publicly, before these big crowds, to make Jesus look foolish. Well, they considered their religious traditions equal with Scripture. Now, it's hard to believe, but they did. And we're going to see here in the first verse, it says, Then the scribes and Pharisees, the religious crowd, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples, here's the gotcha question, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He's not talking about what we think about washing hands before eating. That's always a good practice, but no, that's not what they're talking about. It's not a sanitary thing on the outside. It's a religious ritual that they're ascribing to, calling Jesus out on because he's not following the religious tradition, the ritual of ceremonial cleansing. It's all a ceremony to show that you're outside is clean. And by making your outside clean by the washing of hands is a symbol of an inward cleanliness. It's a work. It's an effort to appease God by doing something. And to them, it wasn't a symbol. It was a work for righteousness. And so many religious people today do the same thing, if you think about it. And sometimes we're guilty of that. They go through some outward physical ceremony that so-called cleans them up on the outside in order to make them necessary to be right with God. I mean, I think of one off the top of my head. It's like you'll invite somebody to come to church. Oh, I can't come to church because I don't have anything to wear. I got to have something nice to wear if I'm going to come to church. And I'm like, well, you know, if you don't have anything, just wear the best thing that you can. If it's jeans and a t-shirt, if that's the best you can do, fine. You're welcome in God's house because he's not concerned with the outward, amen? amen? He's concerned with the inward. The inward is what needs attention. Yeah. The inward's what's dirty and unacceptable to God. Yeah. But if you dress the best you can, I mean, you know, it's not necessary that you have a tie on or a suit on or a dress on to come into God's house. But if you have those things, you might want to uh, dress up for God out of, out of uh, respect and worship and reverence. But, uh, you know, that's not the test for salvation. It's not the test of righteousness. Uh, they'll say, I, I, I don't have anything proper to wear. Well, God wants you to come as you are. But when he gets inside and cleans the inside and tends to the heart of your soul then the outside somehow it just um, spiritually come, becomes cleansed in the fact that you desire to look different. You desire to honor God with your appearance. Amen? Amen. So anyway, they're asking him, they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. They don't do the ceremony like we religious people do. Look what Jesus says to them. 
Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? And Jesus gives them an example of something that they're doing. For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. We've all heard that. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. Now that's in the law, the Old Testament law written for the Jews. Moses would proclaim this to the Jews, to Israel. He who curses mother or father, let him be put to death. Wow. But, Jesus says, here's what you guys say. Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Now, what's he saying there? What he's saying is, you have a responsibility to take care of your parents. If they have a need, if they are in a place where they need health um, uh, care or uh, food or uh, shelter or clothing, or, and you have the means to honor your mother and your father by providing these things, that's something you need to do. That's your responsibility. How do they get around that with tradition? And their tradition that they made up and put on top of God's command to take responsibility for your parents, honor them, they piled on this, that they're going and telling their parents, well, we don't have money to give to you for health care or clothes or shelter. Whatever money we had, we gave it to God. It's a pious way of saying, we're honoring God by not taking care of you. That's what they're really saying. And, and they've made it a way out of handling the commandment of God by putting one of their traditions above it. And, and what did Jesus say? He said, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Now, we all know what a hypocrite is. Somebody who says one thing and does another. And then calls people out for doing something that they're also guilty of doing, right? It's a hypocrite. And that was the term meaning of the day in, uh, that we're here in the, in the Bible during Jesus' day. But it also had a little bit of a deeper meaning. It had, it, it had been coupled with actors. And actors in a play oftentimes would say hypocrite, and it would be a cue to spur an answer on from an actor on the stage. And what Jesus is calling them hypocrites here, and basically he's saying, you're an actor in a play here. You're playing at being a religious person. You're playing with the commandments of God, and you're heaping on your traditions. He's calling them out for an answer now, like an actor would in a play, because they're playing at religion. The religious leaders were eager to have people go through their ceremonies of washing hands but they ignored the condition of the heart, the real issue of mankind, which was the important thing to God. So we're good at rationalizing too. Oftentimes we're guilty of this. Uh, parents say to their children, you wash your hands before you come to the table, don't we? Well, we should, especially in these days. But oftentimes uh, parents don't pay attention to what their children are seeing on television, on their devices, their computers. And these things are damaging their heart. It's the heart issue here that we're ignoring. Now, just recently, I don't want to belabor the point, but my goodness, I, I went to Walmart. I was in their game aisle. You know, remember games that used to come in a box? You used to have Monopoly, the Game of Life, and all those good things. I went in their box game aisle, and I couldn't believe my eyes, and neither could my wife. There was so much, first and foremost, occult things fortune-telling thing, demon things, wizard things, magical things, right off, slap me in the face. And then I saw a bunch of sexy things, you know, lusty things, uh, those kind of games, and then a bunch of drinking games. I'm like, man, I've been, I, I've been gone for too long from shopping. I, I usually do my stuff online, but that's getting bad too. I popped online to Amazon. I put Christmas gifts for my wife. The most filthy stuff was coming up on Amazon. It's unbelievable. Then, but see, our kids are looking at this stuff, and we're letting them. Well, it's only Amazon. It's got to be a good place, right? It's, right? Anyway, so I'm at a major book retailer. I mean, one of the big boys. And I took a picture of this, but I'm not going to show you, because you know what? You can't unsee this stuff. In the main aisle, kids are running all around because, again, wizards, the occult, Harry Potter, all this stuff is just so attractive to the young mind 
Uh, that was everywhere I looked, but then I saw this one end cap dial, and you know how when you see a bad word sometimes, a, a, a curse word, that they'll put an asterisk where the vowel is? Like that's going to make you not think of what the word is? I mean, that kind of like makes you remember what it is. So this whole shelf, and it was different authors too. Every shelf, different asterisk word in the title, biggest day. Kids are running around looking at it, snickering at it. And I mean, we're just letting them do it. We're not protecting them. There's, anyway, it's a hard issue that's allowing this stuff in public and it's influencing our kids to the point it's influencing us till we think it's okay. It's no big deal. We should all wash our hands, but what is on the inside is most important. And we must deal with the heart condition that we find ourselves in before the Lord. So Jesus is calling them out. Hypocrites. He's looking for an answer now. Respond. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you? Now, Jesus is going back to the Jewish scriptures some 800 years now before this event. And he's quoting scriptures that the religious crowd for sure should have had memorized. And he's quoting Isaiah. Because Isaiah saw this day in Jewish life where the heart and traditions covered the commands and truth of God's word. He's quoting Isaiah. Look at verse 8. These people draw near to me, God says, with their mouth. They're saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. They're praying publicly. They draw to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their heart is what? Far from me. Is what? And in vain they worship me. God, that worship's not going any farther than the ceiling. It's a look at me how good I can sing, or look at me how good I dress today, and how righteous I look. It's all about me. It's not about God. The words are right. The heart is wrong. The tradition is you go to church. You did your, your bit this week. You... You appeased God this week. You did God a favor by coming this week. That's a hard issue. You're not doing any God, God any favor by coming to church. Unless your heart is aligned to meet with him, to worship him in spirit and in truth. They were worshiping him in vain. And they were teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It's more important to wash your hands and show up looking like a religious person than living like one. So look at the next verse, verse 10. When he had called the multitude to himself, the great crowd, he said to them, hear and understand not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Okay, he gave him something to think about. Jesus was saying that moral defilement is spiritual. It's not the physical. It's not doing something. People think they get saved when they get baptized. That that's some sort of a magic potion of holy water and you're saved and your sins are washed away. No, that's an outward act, and it is a command to be baptized if you're born again, if you're saved, if your heart got right with God. Amen. And if your heart was right with God, you have a desire to proclaim publicly the inward change in an outward way, just as the Lord has commanded us and exampled for us himself to do. It's a symbol of his death, burial, and resurrection. Going into that watery grave for us, coming out with Jesus, resurrected to newness of life the old has passed away in the grave the new comes up and out and lives a life that's pleasing to god that physical representation doesn't do that the faith that you placed in christ before you did the outward did that amen you're just proclaiming the inward change in an outward way because people can't see salvation they can see it in your lifestyle eventually they can see it in your works, in your heart, in your, in your service, in your speech, in your sincerity, in your genuineness. But uh, Christ commanded us to publicly proclaim with the outward, but that's 
after the spiritual's taken care of, after the heart issues dealt with. Amen? Because we all have a heart that's what? Desperately wicked. Then, in verse 12, his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? They're like, Jesus, don't you know you just offended the the religious crowd? I can't believe you did that. What are you thinking, Jesus? They, they They weren't thinking spiritually. They weren't thinking of the heart quite. See, the disciples were amazed that Jesus would offend the Pharisees, the religious crowd, because up to this point, there'd been conflict between Jesus and the religious crowd as we've seen in our lessons. But now this is the breaking point. I mean, Jesus is just letting them have it plain and simple, and they're not receiving it. They're rejecting what he's presenting here, that there's a heart issue. They're all about the outward rituals. There's no heart issue here. But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Now, Jesus is speaking in parables here to those who have a heart to hear and receive. And what he's saying here is every plant, which here means system. Every, it's a root system, like a plant has, you know, the plants that we, we pull our dandelions out and there's all these dangly root systems, right? Yeah. Well, and now that's the way it is with a religious system. A false religious system has all kinds of tentacles, that take root into our life, into our belief system. So Jesus is basically saying here, every religious system which my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. And the religious crowd here has a lot of rooted tentacles of wrong teaching, wrong understanding, full of ritualistic root, rather than heart-driven fruit. Look at verse 14, what Jesus' advice is. Jesus says, you go and beat them up with my word. You go and guilt them into getting right with God. You tell them, turn or burn. No, he doesn't say that, does he? Let them alone. Let them alone. You're not going to tell them any different. They are rooted in their false belief system. All you can do is take care of your walk with the Lord, and God will use that to bless, to convict, to do his will in his plan for their life and for your life. He says, let them alone. Why? They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Just let them go. If there was any talking to him, don't you think Jesus would have talked to him? Because he was trying to. They weren't having it. They were rejecting the truth. Look at verse 14. Let them alone. Now, verse 15. Then Peter, the inquisitive one, I love Peter. Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. Take us deeper, Lord. Give us more understanding here. We're we're biting on this, but we're not quite there yet. And so the Lord uh, hadn't been able to get to the point yet in Peter's mind and heart. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth, we're talking about the physical here, food, goes into the stomach, Jesus is getting real plain here, real basic, and is eliminated. Think about it. We eat, our stomach's satisfied, it digests, we go to the bathroom. It's eliminated. And so it's waste. What goes in physically is used up and is turned to waste, is turned to refuse. It's the physical realm that we're talking about. It's to be disposed of, gotten rid of. It's good for nothing. It's to be flushed. Can I get a witness? Yes. That's the physical. That's the hand-washing thing. Throw that out. It's flushed. It's physical. It has no spiritual qualities to it. Verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth, what you put in is physical, but what comes out of the mouth, our speech, reveals our heart. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile man. So now we're talking the spiritual realm. 
It's no longer the physical, like the hand washing, the food. No, the spiritual comes out of the heart, out of the mouth. And that's what really matters. That's where the true battle is raging in fallen mankind. It always goes back to the fact that man has a heart problem. Someone once said this. Now listen. What is in the well of the heart will come up in the bucket of the mouth sooner or later. You can only fake your heart condition for so long. Eventually you're going to slip and it's going to come out. And that defiles us. Verse 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Think about murders. Well, I've never murdered anyone. Yes, you have, and so have I. We've hated somebody. We've wished them ill will. We might have even thought about ways we can harm them. We may have even thought about the unspeakable. I wish they were dead. We may have even told them that. And Jesus said, if you have those thoughts of murder, you've already murdered in the heart, spiritually. Amen. That's defiling before our holy God. Adulteries. Wow, since COVID, pornography, it's up 212%, they say. And it was already high. Adultery of the heart. Well, I didn't do anything physical. Well, you did, but uh, it was from the heart. And it was as good of stepping out on your, your mate in the Lord's holiness. Fornication. Everybody, dating now just, is just another way of saying you're sleeping with someone. You know, it's such a lackadaisical attitude towards uh, sex now that it's just a given if you're going out on a date you're going to have sex it's fornication according to God you know anything outside of marriage is an illegal union in God's eyes that's marriage between a man and a woman by the way Amen. false well what's next fornications uh, thefts we've all taken something that didn't belong to us sometime or another False witness, we've all lied on somebody. We've all embellished our stories and threw someone under the bus at some time. Even as a Christian, we've done these things. This is not good. It's a heart issue that needs addressed. Blasphemies. Using the Lord's name in vain. You know, lying about what you did in the name of the Lord, but really it was to, to uh, promote your agenda or your standing or the pat on the back, the attaboy to make you look good, not the Lord. That's between you and God, but it's a blasphemy. And, and, and when you think about these things, think about this. Uh, the, the evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These things entertain us. These are the components of a best-selling book, aren't they? That's a great book. Look at all that sex and false witness and theft. And these are the things of blockbuster movies that we give millions of dollars to Hollywood to produce and then we complain when things are getting a little too nasty and out of hand. But we allow our kids to watch these things. Long-running TV series are full of these things. And we sit in front of the TV every night and watch these things. They're our entertainment. And we're allowing them to entertain us. We feed the flesh and we starve the spirit and become a religious Pharisee before our holy God. In the name of Jesus, we come to church. We shouldn't be feeding the flesh. We should be starving the flesh, feeding the spirit with the word of God. We, you know, that's Satan's script. All those things, the thefts, the false witness, the adulteries, the fornication, the blasphemies, the lying. Let's put up a, a scripture. God wants us to flip the script of Satan. Look what the scripture tells us to do. Finally, brethren, what, whatever things are true. Truth's not relative. The world would have you believe that. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, do what? Meditate on these things. 
Spend your time thinking about those things, investing on those things, living out those things, consuming your time and your dollars on those things brings honor and glory to God because it's from the heart that you're doing that. It shows your desire to have a heart that's clean with God. It shows your dis- that, that God has done a work within you, that he's transforming you because you've allowed him to put you under his influence rather than the influence of the world, which is down and dirty. Amen? Does that make sense? Yes. Go to the next verse, Ricky. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Jesus says. Well, Paul says this in Philippians. But Jesus, he's following Jesus. Jesus did all these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. What? These do. And the God of peace will be with you. People want peace, and people are paying a dear price for peace. They're rejecting the God of peace, the only one that could give you peace and satisfaction in life, and they're turning to everything the world has to offer, and they're not getting peace. Amen. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. That's all outward. That's not dealing with the heart. These things are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So we're in a period of a new woke morality. Can I get a witness? And we've reached the day that Isaiah talked about when he said that they would call evil good and good evil. And I want you to see what Isaiah has to say. Again, 800 years before our scripture time, look at this. Woe to those who call evil good. We're there. And good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Keep going, Ricky. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's writing an op-ed. Everybody's got a YouTube channel. Everybody's got a Facebook forum where they're talking and preaching and teaching the gospel according to them. And they're prudent in their own sight. But they're rejecting and neglecting God. We have a heart problem. Can I get a witness? But God has shown us throughout Scripture that every society that subscribes to lawlessness, are we a society that subscribes to lawlessness? Can I get a witness? Has it, can I get a witness here? Because have you looked at Oregon or, or San Francisco lately? I mean, come on. New York City? Are you kidding me? Did you ever think you'd live to see the day? that lawlessness would reign supreme and that courts are finding lawlessness as righteousness. The days of Isaiah have come. And every society throughout history that subscribes to a lawless, organized society where, as the Bible, this is Bible terminology here, where everyone does what is right in their own eyes. You look throughout Judges, that's what happened and judgment came, judgment upon judgment from God. They, those lands, those societies, those cities, those peoples began in anarchy, as we're witnessing today, and they ended in judgment of God. He shut them down. He allowed them to be conquered, and new civilizations cropped up until they went bad. And the same process over and over. And unfortunately, I'm afraid to say, we're at that point in our country, and we're at that point in our world And the Lord's about ready to just pull the plug and come back and kick his plan into high gear. That's the next thing on his calendar. So we got to get ready. Widespread support for a terror group, Hamas, against Israel? That's the biggest example we're seeing in the news today. And it's because of woke culture confusion. Without God, there's confusion. Who's the author? Confusion. Do we have a new morality? No. No, this, woke, this, this woke culture confusion, that's nothing new. But man is now in our society able to truly and freely express what's in his heart. And we're getting smacked in the face with it every day. Amen. We see the depravity of man before us. 
in all the headlines and all the blurbs on the news on all the advertisement that comes through our devices and on the billboards and just it's all around us the depravity of a fallen heart rejecting god so we have the same old things evil thoughts murders adultery fornication false witness blasphemy and thefts hey if it feels good do it the one who leaves this world with the most toys wins the game really That's what the pharaohs thought, and now they got these big old empty pyramids out in the middle of nowhere, right? So we're in trouble. We have a heart trouble. It's all about us today. We see the emphasis on sex in our schools. We're allowing it. Even in our churches, lots of scandals throughout the world of the church. On television and our internet devices, it stares at us from the billboards, from the covers of magazines, newspaper headlines. These things defile, and no one is immune to it. Our children are being defiled all in the name of freedom of speech. Can I get a witness? The things that are in the heart of man are now coming out. So the question we have to ask ourselves is the title of this message. Are we following traditions over the commandments of God? Do we place more credence in traditions of men? We've always done it like this. Or God's word. We need to start doing it like this. Like the commercial says, what's in your wallet? Well, let's change it. What's in your spiritual wallet? What's in your heart is what that says. Who's in your heart? Because God's a person. And he wants to have a relationship with you because he died for you for your sins. And he loved you so much that while we were yet sinners, he still died for us. And he's waiting for us to acknowledge him. He's waiting for us to ask him to, tr- to forgive us and to come into our hearts and transform us from the inside out. To give us a, a new heart. A heart that wants to do his will, that has passion and desire to live a life that's pleasing to him. Please stand as we close. I just want to challenge you to renew even before New Year's. Because New Year's, everybody makes resolutions, right? Nobody keeps them but a week or two. But you can make a resolution today. That today is the day of salvation for you. Now is the accepted time. That's what the scripture says. Because we're not guaranteed our next moment. And Christ is ready to come back. That's next on his calendar. Are you ready to meet your maker? Are you ready to stand before him with his blood shed upon your sins and covering them so that his righteousness shines through you? Or are you willing to take on God and stand before him in pride with your sins staring at his face? and proclaiming yourself just before a just and holy God. It's not going to fly. It's not going to happen. So today, Jesus wants you to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come to him. And you don't have to do anything but place faith in him. Acknowledging that you're, there is a God and it's not you. Acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and you're not your own Savior. And that there's a King of Kings and it's not you. He wants to sit on the throne of your heart and your life. we got to get out of his seat. You You see those bumper stickers, Jesus is my co-pilot. Are you kidding me? I hope none of you guys put those on your car. He's not the co-pilot. He is the pilot. Jesus, take the wheel. No, he should always be behind the wheel. Otherwise, we're going to crash, right? Crash and burn. Father, we come to you thanking you for your goodness, for your salvation, for your word today. Help us, Lord, to recognize traditions of men that we trust in. Some people are trusting in communion for salvation. Some people are trusting in baptism. Or some people are trusting in the fact that their parents always went to this particular church and that makes them a a saved, born-again Christian and they never set foot in that that, that very uh, establishment. Uh, Lord, we trust in so many things. We trust in rubbing a rabbit's foot and knocking on wood. It's ridiculous. We're deceived. Lord, there's only one thing we can trust in. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you do all the hard work, Lord. You provided the salvation by going to the cross, the sacrifice, the death, burial, and resurrection, Lord. And you went to prepare a place in heaven for all who believe. Lord, you did all the hard stuff. And then even when we believe, you still do all the hard stuff. We don't have to start going to different programs and doing different things. You compel us. You give us a new heart to want to. It's no longer a have to. It's a want to. And you'll do anything 
to make a life that's pleasing to you, Lord. And I thank you for that desire you put into my born-again heart and in the hearts of those that in here are born again. But those who have never experienced a life change, Lord, you've promised in your word that when we place saving faith in you, that the, it is evident that old things pass away and all things become new. You do that hard work. You transform us from the inside out. We don't have to do anything but believe. And we step back and allow you to put us under your influence. I mean, we so easily put ourselves under the care of a doctor or the care of a pill or the care of a drug or care of por pornography to soothe our, 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 our angst, our soul. To, uh, 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 the, the, we, we put ourselves under the influence of alcohol. We put ourselves under the influence of gambling. We put, all these things are supposed to bring us satisfaction and relief from a life of, that's falling around, apart around us, a world that's falling apart around us. And yet it just digs a deeper grave for us. Lord, the only hope is to redirect our heart to you, the God of hope. And Lord, when we do that, you do all the hard stuff for us. We just step back and allow you to transform us from the inside out. And you'll take us as far as we'll let you take us. You'll never force your way into our heart. You'll never beat the door down. You'll never make us anything we don't want to be. But Lord, help us to recognize the need for forgiveness of sins and, and a need for a Savior. And you'll do the rest. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, before you leave, we've got the altar workers here. Please. If you have a question, if you want prayed for, if you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to be saved, you want to get baptized, if you have a need, please come up here and see Jim, and we will make sure your needs are attended to through the scriptures by the Lord. Thank you for coming today. Go out there and give them Jesus. We'll see you next time. <laughs>